Wonderful when Jesus uh, says to his disciples, no longer do I call you my disciples, no longer do I call you my followers, I call you my friends. And, uh, well, that puts us in the same category as Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who were called friends with God. Which is a wonderful, seamless link to what we're going to start looking at on a Sunday evening. So uh, a few months ago, we looked at the, the life of Abraham and how Abraham is the father of all those who have faith. So Abraham's faith is a model of all those who have faith in the Lord Jesus. Well, we're going to uh, pick up looking at Isaac and Jacob and Esau. So uh, turn to Genesis chapter 25 and we're going to read from verse 19. So Abraham has died and been buried uh, by his two sons, uh, Isaac and Ishmael. And uh, we read, verse 19, This is the account of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean from Padam Aram, and sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebecca became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau, which uh, sounds like hairy in Hebrew. It's not a name you'd give your children, is it really? <laughs> After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, which means grasper. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up. And Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet, quiet man staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm Famished. That is why he was also called Edom, which in Hebrew means red. And the descendants of Esau are called Edomites. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some red lentil stew. He ate and drank, got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now what is this all about? Well, that's what preachers are for, and that's what the Holy Spirit is for too enlighten God's word to us and explain it to us and make it become real. Now, the problem is it's starting in the middle of a book in the Bible. That's not the way God starts his work. In fact, that's not the way that, that most things are ordered in this world. So take, for example, two and a bit months ago when Putin sent his troops to invade Ukraine. 
Was that the start of it? Well, no, it wasn't. You go back to 2014, when he stole Crimea from Ukraine, sent the troops in, and uh, the West basically did nothing. A few little sanctions, but it gave Putin the idea of, hey, I can get away with whatever I want. Actually, you can go further back than that. I think it was about 2008, um, uh, Moldova and another country applied, Georgia, applied for NATO membership, and NATO turned them down. It will upset Russia too much. So Putin, say straight away, sent a load of paratroopers in and took a strip of land in Georgia. And the West did nothing. So even big events like invasions don't happen overnight. Normally there's been a whole sequence of things that leads up to them. Because the problem is that very often we're asleep to what has already been going on. And we don't recognise the consequences. Now, what we need to know from this passage is, is, well, this hasn't just suddenly been dropped in to the book of Genesis. We're, we're halfway through. And God had made promises right from the start when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden against their maker, Instead of being cursed, the Lord had given them a promise that from your male seed, a deliverer would come. He would put everything right that Adam and Eve, by listening to Satan, had put wrong. They brought disaster, disease, decay, death, physical death and spiritual death into God's good creation. They brought evil into God's good creation. But God had said, I'm making you a promise. From you, a male seed will come and he will crush the serpent's head. So he'll destroy the serpent and all his work, but the serpent will bite him. So the first promise of Jesus, there in the first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. And, and from that moment on, there's this concentration on the, where's the male seed coming? Where's he coming from? When's he coming? What section of the family, what section of the human race is he going to come from? And it's narrowed down then to Abraham. Abraham was a worshipper of false gods and idols and the sun and the moon. And the Lord met with Abraham, who lived in Babel. This is just after the Tower of Babel episode. And the Lord said, I will make you a great name. And I will make from you a great nation. And from your male seed... All the nations of the world will be blessed. They will receive God's blessing, the blessing of salvation, of forgiveness, of being made right with God. It's not saying that all the other nations were not important to God and he didn't care, but he's saying, look, it's this nation from Abraham that the Messiah is going to come, and that's how my salvation will touch all the other nations. Now, Abraham was 75 years old when God made that promise to him. And Sarah was 65, and they'd never had children. And she was barren. And they had to wait till Abraham was 100 years old, and Sarah was 90 years old before they had Isaac. A miracle child. And God is teaching the start of his kingdom the start of his saving works is miraculous. It's not natural. It's got nothing to do with man's attempts. Abraham could have tried all he wanted. He couldn't make Sarah pregnant. Sarah could try all she wanted. She could not become pregnant. So it's not man's actions. God said, this time next year, Abraham, you're going to have a son. And Abraham laughed. And Sarah laughed. And God said, right, well, you've got to call him laughter then. Isaac. We're told very little about Isaac, except in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all lived in tents because they were seeking a city whose builder and maker is God. 
In other words, they were quite happy to live in the wilderness and to live in tents because they were looking for a heavenly city. They were looking for eternal life. They didn't anchor all their hopes and dreams just to this life. And God said, the Messiah is going to come. The Christ is going to come. The Saviour is going to come from your family. And Isaac now, there's very little, we're told very little about Isaac through scripture, except he was a believer. Seems he was just a quiet man who quietly walked with God. And Isaac married Rebecca. We saw the story of that, how uh, Abraham's servant was sent off uh, in faith to try and find a wife. And there was the camels and the watering of the camels and God's wonderful provision. So he's got Rebecca. And what are we told? Well, again, God is reminding us that the start of his work has got to be supernatural. So he doesn't just do it once. He does this twice. Did it with Abraham. Did you notice he had to do it with Isaac and Rebecca? Because Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebecca. And it says she was barren. And she did not have a baby for 20 years. So what is God teaching? Well, this is, this is the Abraham-Sarah incident all over again. It's saying that God's work has got to be supernatural and miraculous at its very start. And God knows that his people are a bit thick. We don't get it to start off with. And then even when we do get it, we forget. So he has to constantly remind us. And sometimes he teaches us in theology. Sometimes he teaches it in practice. And this is him teaching it in practice. The same thing happened to Isaac and Rebekah that had happened to Abraham and Sarah. They had to wait 25 years. Isaac and Rebekah have to wait 20 years. And it's not just that they're childless. That's not their biggest problem. The biggest problem is that God had said to Abraham, through your seed Isaac, my promise will be reckoned. The promise of the Messiah. But here's the problem. You've got to have male seed in order for a male seed to come and be the saviour. And what's the problem? There's not even a seed, let alone a male seed. And so what does Isaac do? Verse 21. Isaac prayed to the Lord. Now, in my version, it says on behalf of his wife. In the Hebrew, it says with his wife. So this isn't Isaac going off into the desert and just praying by himself with the Lord. No, no. This is Isaac and Rebekah taking this burden to the Lord. And it's a double burden. There's the ordinary burden of when you get married, you expect to have children. That's the natural way. That's God's natural order. And they haven't got a child. And it's in a culture where it is shameful to be married and not have a child. You must have done something wrong. Uh, we, we've got friends. Um, he's Christian background. She's Hindu background. And uh, they got married on Christmas Day. And... As far as we still know, they're still childless and the whole family disowned them because she was a Hindu and, well, childless. And they're childless because they got married on a Christian festival in a Hindu country. And so, family, uh, you've upset the gods. And that's what would have been going on here. So that's the natural burden. But there's also a spiritual burden. Isaac knows that God's promise is through his male line he's not the messiah but he's got no male children notice he doesn't make the same mistake that his mum and dad made there's no hagar incident rebecca doesn't say well i'm barren take my servant because we know the problems that caused with ishmael and everything else and the world is still paying for that one 
So what does he do? Well, he's a spiritual man. He knows God's power and he knows God's promises. So what does he do? He takes it to the Lord. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. He knows that. He could have written it. Him and his wife, they kneel down before the Lord and you can imagine them doing what prayer really is. Prayer is claiming God's promises. You've promised a male seed will come, that it's through my line, not through Ishmael's, not through anyone else's, it's through my line that the Messiah will come. But God, you, you, you haven't kept your promise yet. My, my wife is barren. God, keep your promise. And you've got the power to keep the promise. God, do it. You did it for my dad and my mum when it was impossible. God, do it for me. So there would be no mistaking that when it happened, they knew it was a miracle and it was all God's work. God's promises of salvation, of a Messiah coming, are supernatural. And God is teaching that in very practical, though painful, way. What happened? The Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. So far, so good. <laughs> then we have the struggle of salvation. <coughs> we know salvation is supernatural. Now we've got a, we say salvation is a struggle. And she, Rebecca knows that this, this isn't an ordinary problem. She's got twins, right? double blessing. But it literally says these twins fought each other in the womb. They were having a boxing match. match. It's bad enough, isn't it? You know, normally, ladies, when you're, when you're during the day and you're pregnant, you know, you're, you're moving around and you're rocking the babies to sleep, aren't you? Because you're, you're busy and you're doing stuff. And then you lie down because you're tired and you need a rest and the flipping things wake up. <laughs> and they're kicking and shoving. And, but that's normal. But she knows that what's going on is not normal. This isn't babies kicking, you know, trying to get a, a, a football scholarship before they're even born. <laughs> you know, this isn't that. They're, they're scrapping, they're fighting, they're wrestling each other, even while they're still inside the womb. And she knows that this is strange. She can't explain why. What does she do? She said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. So they both went to the Lord in prayer to start off with, to say, God, keep your promise, work in your power. This is for your glory, your honour, the good of the nations. Keep your promise. God's answered that prayer. But now that she knows there's something not right and she doesn't understand why. So she went to inquire of the Lord and the Lord spoke to her God's word gives us a promise if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask of God who gives liberally and does not reproach you when there are things that you do not understand you don't understand where God is what what he's got to do in this situation how he's working what he's designed for for you in that situation the Bible says, even if you should have asked him weeks or months or years ago, when you finally do ask him, he never tells you off. He gives liberally and without reproach. And here's a wonderful example of that. She goes and inquires of the Lord. She knows something's not right. She can't explain it. She inquires of the Lord and the Lord gives her the answer. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples, literally two people groups, from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. He said, 
God is explaining to her, inside your womb, there is a battle going on. That's why you feel these two boys struggling. And two nations are in your womb. And, and everything's upside down. I, I'm totally changing the order, ordinary nature of things. The eldest is going to end up serving the youngest. The stronger is going to be a servant of the weaker. Now, to us, that doesn't really mean much, does it? But uh, I tell you, you talk to twins, they always know which one was born first. <laughs> you know, I'm the eldest by a minute, but I'm still the eldest. So you, my little brother, you will do what you are told. Now, that's human nature, isn't it? I was, I was the eldest, not of twins, I was the eldest. Trouble is, my little brothers never did what I was <laughs> told. <laughs> but it's a spiritual picture as well. And, and the key is in the language. Two peoples from within will be separated or set apart. And the Bible says that's what's going to happen on the Day of Judgment as well. Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats, the believers from the unbelievers. And, and the Lord is explaining to Rebecca, inside your womb, that battle that is going on is a picture of the spiritual battle in humanity from those who follow Satan and those who follow Jesus. And they're constantly fighting each other. And they will be till Jesus comes again. And Rebecca, that is what you are experiencing in your womb. It's the fight between the believing line and the unbelieving line. It's the fight between those who value the Lord Jesus and are going to follow him and those who don't give a monkeys about Jesus. And there's a fight. There's a war going on. And one people will be stronger than the other. That's Esau, the unbelievers. Esau, when he grows up, he's a big, hairy, muscle-bound, sweaty hunter. He's a man of the field. He's a man's man. That's the way of the world. But the believer, the believing line, is going to be Jacob, who is, we're told, a quiet man who stayed among the tents. That's the principle God always works on. Look at us. They poor are full of movers and shakers here, aren't we? Hey, we're gonna we're gonna change the world. No, we are gonna change the world. But we're not movers and shakers. Because that's not the principle God operates on. That's the principle the world operates on. The world operates on if you are high-born, and that's still most of our politicians, sadly. They're, they're, most of them have been to Oxbridge. And uh, they've gone straight from Oxbridge to being politicians. Uh, what do they call them? Research, Research assistants and everything. And then they go to being MPs. And they're still the movers and the shakers. And they uh, in banking and in industry, still the majority of the movers and shakers are from the well-to-do families. They've been to private school, and not just in this country, we're talking around the world. They've had money behind them, like Trump. Hey, oh, Trump, self-made billionaire. No, he's not. He inherited millions from his dad. And that's what gave him a bit of a, bit of a helping hand to start off in life. He doesn't say make much of that in his book. It's all about me, 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 me. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says to the church in Corinth. Now, e even that, the word Corinth, would have shocked most people because the Greek slang word for a prostitute was a Corinthian. And yet there was a church in Corinth. And... This is what the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says to them. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 
26. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the people who think they're something so, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore it's written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. See, here's the ordinary way of things. We tend to think God only uses big, strong churches full of professionals, full of wise people, full of influential people. We, but that's worldly thinking. God's ways are always to use the weak and the despised and the things that the people will look at and go, they're nobodies, they're nothing. They can make no impact at all. So that when God works, you can only boast in the Lord. When the time gave her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red. His body's hairy. He's called Esau. His brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebecca gave but cool. my brother's just had a new baby son at the age of 52 and he's already shattered and the baby's a month old. <sighs> Think how Isaac must have been. <laughs> Whose strength would he have to have relied on? Even youths grow weak and faint. But those who rely on the Lord will renew their strength. And then we have a great big gap. See, God's not interested in, in all the hunky-dories of them growing up and teenage years and everything else. God's always interested in the spiritual message. And we go straight now from their birth to their adulthood. Verse 27, the boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter. A man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, why is that there? Well, the Bible tells us that all these things that happened in the Old Testament were written to teach us on whom the end of the ages has come. Why is that there? Well, God had said, before the boys are born, the older will serve the younger. That's God's plan. Okay? So Isaac is the one that God's blessings, are, uh, Jacob is the one that God's blessings are going to be upon, that uh, is, going to, is going to be the one that through the Messiah is to be born. But he's not his dad's cup of tea. Esau, who represents the ungodly line, the unbelieving line, the one who doesn't value anything spiritual, he's a man's man. And he's his dad's favourite because he loves what his son catches. He goes and he shoots venison and he gives him Oh, a great big chunks of meat. <laughs> you didn't complain at lamb. I did not complain at lamb, but it's not because my favourite son caught it. <laughs> Why is this there? Well, what problems happen 
because Isaac's favourite son was Esau. Well, Jacob has to get the blessing that God said was rightfully his by deception because even though Isaac knows that that was God's plan, that wasn't his favourite son. His favourite son was Esau. So he planned to give the blessing going against God's plan to his oldest son Esau. And so Jacob has to mimic and pretend that he's his older brother. His older brother wants to kill him. He has to run for his life. He never sees his mum again. Why is that here? Well, it's got to be this, hasn't it? It's to warn us. As believers, don't fall into this trap of having favourites amongst your children. Don't do it. It will cause terrible, terrible consequences. That doesn't mean to say that you listen to your children going, that's not fair, Mum, you've got a favourite. <laughs> it's not fair, Dad, you've got a favourite. No, no, don't listen to your children. Listen to your own conscience. Listen to your own heart. Listen to the Holy Spirit. And surely, in the context of this passage, when there was no children, they prayed. When there's a struggle going on, Rebecca prays and seeks the Lord. It's to say this, if you're tempted to have favourites, or if you already have favourites, you go to the Lord, you seek his forgiveness, and you seek his help to put things right. It is, well, God's word says that God has no favourites. And so to be godly means that we behave like God. What else happens? Once Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. So he's obviously not caught anything. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. It seemed that part of Jacob was a quiet man living in tents meant he loved cooking. He would have been on one of the modern celebrity chef programmes, probably. And he's made red lentil stew. And the smell is wafting around the campsite. And Esau comes in and oh, he's, he's, he's shattered from a day's hunting. And he's starving. And the smell and the, the, the juices are going straight away. And he goes up to his brother and he goes, Quick! Let me have some of that stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, mm -hmm. First, sell me your birthright. <laughs> Esau, all he sees is problem. Jacob, in problems, he sees opportunity. <laughs> and he goes, sell me your birthright. Now, what does that mean? Well, the eldest son, Deuteronomy tells us, got twice as much inheritance as the younger son. And so Jacob goes, well, you're the older. You're going to get twice the inheritance. Sign it over to me. Sell your birthright to me. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? He goes, well, well I'd have to wait for Dad to die to get that birthright. I would, I, he's only 60. I mean, look how long our granddad lived for. That, that, I can't wait that long. I, I want the stew now. Jacob said, Swear to me, literally, make a covenant with me. Sign the dotted line. Sign it over to me now, and then you can have the stew. <laughs> the smell is wafting up. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob, 
Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, got up and left. So was he really dying? See, some commentators say, well, this, this, is, this is terrible. Jacob takes advantage of a dying man and he's his brother. He should have just given him the stew. That's not what the Bible says. See, we've always got to listen to what the Bible says, to how God says, this is how I see what's going on. What's the very last sentence in the passage? So Esau despised his birthright. So is the scripture saying that Jacob did anything wrong? No. Who's the one who's in the wrong? Esau. Esau despised his God-given right. Because it was God who said in Deuteronomy, the elder son is to get twice as much. So, what is Esau despising? What God has given him. For the future. Because it only happened when your dad died. So Esau is despising his God-given gift that is some way off in the future and he sells it for a little pot of red lentil stew now. That's the mark of an unbeliever. That's the way of the world. I will have all the blessings now and heaven and eternal life and being with God that's so far off in the future it's of no use to me whatsoever I want food, I want money, I want prosperity I want pleasure, I want happiness and I want it now that's the way of the world they despise God's gospel promises for the future So it says in, in Hebrews chapter 11, picking up exactly the same thing. And it says this. So Hebrews, sorry, that's Hebrews chapter 12. See that no one is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son and afterwards when he wanted to inherit this blessing was rejected he could bring about no change of mind even though he sought the blessing with tears you despise God's blessings and then there might be a time when you wake up and you realize no 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 I, I've I've I, I, I've given up too much. I, I want it back. And God goes, sorry, too late. Too late. Sadly, sometimes that's not just people outside the church. Sadly, sometimes that's even people in the church. They hear Sunday by Sunday by Sunday all of God's wonderful promises and blessings and yet they go out of a church on a Sunday and they live for the world and they live for the here and they live for the now and they don't value eternity and all of God's blessings in the future. And then one day they wake up and it's too late. That's a sombre reminder and a sombre warning. Do not be like Esau. Or as Paul says in, in Philippians, their God is their belly. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. We can come to him and say, Jesus, I've had favourites amongst my children. Sometimes I've despised your promises. I've taken you for granted. I haven't acted upon them. I've lived for the here and the now and not given a thought about eternity and about your son. 
will you forgive me? Will you have me? And God's word says, now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, forgive me if I've uh, made it uh, way more complicated. Lord, uh, whatever is just of me is just chaff uh, and irrelevant. Blow it away, burn it up. But what is from you? Lord, would you take it in the power of your spirit and implant it in our hearts that it might bear fruit of changed lives, of valuing you and your promises and of seeking to walk with you. And when we don't understand what's going on, to seek your face, to ask you for wisdom, with that confidence you give liberally and without reproach. Help us, Lord, to value you, to value the Lord Jesus Christ more even than life itself. Uh, because he is the one who uh, has given up his life for us so that we can have eternal life. Amen.